Good morning, everybody. This morning I'm going to briefly run through um, radiological investigations, um, which is uh, a lot about what orthopedics is about. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give a, a brief run through of each kind of modality we use from x-ray through to PET scans, um, how they work, uh, indications for their use, pros and cons of each, and a bit of a breakdown of costs and also looking at uh, radiation safety in orthopedics. Um, so starting off with a plain old x-ray. Um, so this is the most widely used uh, imaging modality in orthopedics and also generally across the medical field and makes up 80% of all um, imaging modalities used. Classically, we used to use the film screen combination, but nowadays we've gone towards digital. Um, and uh, the x-ray, the way it's done is there's an x-ray beam which is projected through an object, which is classically the person, and that's uh, projected through onto an image detector. Um, most of the beam is absorbed uh, by the patient, and some of it is scattered, and therefore only a small amount of it ends up being detected um, on the detector or film at the background. Um, and the image produces a basically a project projectional map of the amount of radiation absorbed. Um, so depending on the density of the object or the person in the structures, um, depends on how much of the beam is absorbed by them and therefore the projection that you see. And that uh, makes up basically the what we see on the image. So there's four basic densities on X-ray, um, going from air through to fat, water, which is made up by blood and soft tissue, and bone. And this is just a, a picture illustrating the densities. Um, so as we know, air um, has the least amount of density, uh, so it's classically the darkest, um, followed by fat, and then water, which is blood and soft tissue, and bone has the most density, so it absorbs the most, and therefore it uh, comes out as the whitest. Um, and that's similar for metal as well. Uh, the usual you know, measurement of radiation dose for x-rays is millisievert, um, and this is important looking at radiation doses, which I'll come to a bit later on. Um, as we all know, with x-rays, you need at least a minimum of two views, and that's because x-ray is a uh, 2D modality, and therefore, uh, obviously, if there's an object uh, on the x-ray, you don't know whether it's actually in the patient or around the patient, um, and that's important looking as well for fractures and other um, lesions uh, to determine where exactly they are in the patient in the bone. Um, being a 2D modality, um, you get uh, a lot of artifact and shadowing, um, and that's why uh, two views is essential. Um, positioning the patient is also important because of the magnification effect, and that's one of the cons of X-ray. You do get magnification. Um, the closer the patient is positioned to the X-ray beam, the greater the magnification of the image is going to be because of the scatter of the beam. Um, and therefore, uh, we use, tend to use a magnification marker in a lot of our x-rays um, to see with drone replacements. At Western Health, that's a 2.5 centimetre uh, magnification marker. So we can try and calculate um, our prostheses, etc. So as we all know, x-ray can be used for basically anything. Um, fractures, bony anatomy, um, arthrography and discography um, by use of injection of contrast dye within joints and disc spaces. However, we don't use those as much these days because of CT and other modalities. Uh, the pros, it's readily accessible, it's inexpensive and it's instantaneous. You can see the image straight away. Of course, the cons are it is a 2D um, reconstruction. There's a radiation dose associated with it. Um, it's not effective for soft tissues and the images are magnified. And just to look at the cost, so a digital x-ray unit um, for what we have here at Western Health costs about $600,000. And that costs about $100,000 a year in maintenance to uptake. Um, and just break the down of some of the x-rays we do. So an upper limb x-ray is about $29, a hip joint $47, and a pelvis is $60. So ultrasound. Um, ultrasound works with high frequency sound waves from 3 to 15 millihertz. Uh, so essentially you have the transducer that you put on the body. It sends sound waves down into the tissues. And then these echo waves are reflected back by the tissues and picked up by the transducer. Um, and then the essentially the amplitude of those sound waves and the time it takes for them to bounce back um, produces the image that we see. And it's uh, pictured in grey and white scale. Um, so use is widely used for soft tissues such as tendons, um, non-ossified structures, uh, particularly uh, femoral heads in DDH. 
Um, Doppler ultrasound can be used for DVT assessment and vascular assessment pre-op, um, and obviously therapeutic and diagnostic values. So um, we often use uh, ultrasound for um, therapeutic uh, injection of corticosteroids or also diagnostic, so aspirates um, and uh, samples of collections. The pros of it, there's no radiation involved. It's non-invasive, it's inexpensive, it's very portable, and it can be a targeted therapy or a diagnostic um, approach. Uh, the cons of it, it's highly operator dependent, so it really depends on the skill of your operator um, as to how well they can visualise and also how they interpret um, what's being seen on the ultrasound. Um, you can't visualise inside bones um, because the cortex reflects the, the uh, sound waves and doesn't pick up through it. And also in obese patients, you can't get a good image. And roughly a shoulder ultrasound costs about $50 to $100 depending on exactly what you're doing. Computed tomography um, is uh, very widely used these days in orthopedics, especially with the advances now with 3D reconstruction. Um, it uses X-ray beams to produce tomographic images. So essentially, you have multiple. Um, uh, well, you have a, a rotating fan beam which rotates around the patient and measures uh, thousands of points um, with X-ray, and you get multiple slices. And then the computer software uh, programs all these together. Um, to form a 3D and multiplane reconstruction. Um, so obviously the value of computer tomography is we are able to get a 3D reconstruction and you get multiple planes, so sagittal, coronal, axial, etc. Um, it's a 2D display of 2D information when you're looking at the various slices scrolling through. Therefore this gives you a very accurate representation. So as with x-ray, you can't tell whether an object is within a patient or not. With CT, you can tell exactly where something is in relation to the patient, and that's important visualising uh, lesions and fractures, etc. Uh, the density measurement is done in Hounsfeld units, um, and that ranges, um, follows the same principles of the four different densities as for x-ray. Um, so for example, bone is uh, 2,000 Hounsfeld units, water is zero, and air is at least dense at minus 1,000. Um, and uses for computer tomography, uh, fracture anatomy and bony soft tissue lesions. The pros of it, um, very high contrast resolution, especially for, uh, for cortical and trabecular bone. Um, as I mentioned, we've got the 3D reconstruction now, which is fantastic for us in terms of uh, defining fracture anatomy um, and gives us multiple planes. There's no magnification artifact as what you get with x-ray. So you can make direct measurements, so measuring actually on the imaging screens with the ruler, etc., which you can't do as accurately on x-rays. And um, similarly, you get therapeutic and diagnostic uses, so injections, aspirations, biopsies. The cons, the main one with <coughs> CT is the high radiation dose. So it's roughly between 10 to 100 times that of an x-ray. Um, you also get metal artifacts, which is beam hardening, and that's where you get the... Uh, the scattered the streaks of the white and black that we often see, and that can cause uh, a lot of artifact and obscures the surrounding anatomy. However, uh, technology these days is improving. So there's a lot of digital subtraction technology available that's able to remove that, and in the future, I'm sure we're going to be able to see where that's completely eliminated. Uh, CT is obviously a lot more expensive than plain x-rays. Um, accessibility can sometimes be an option, particularly in more rural areas. Um, it's not mobile and it can be impractical for obese people because a lot of the machines do have weight limits. The cost, um, here at Western Health we have a, a 64 slice scanner, um, which is one of the upper end, uh, and that unit costs $1.2 million. Um, similarly, it takes 100, costs $100,000 a year in uptake. And just roughly, a pelvic CT costs anywhere between $126 to $360, depending on the extent of the scan and whether we use contrast and your basic extremity CT costs $220. MRI, um, so the images are produced by reconstruction of data set. So it looks at the behaviour of proteins in the magnetic field uh, rather than radio density, uh, which is what we see in X-ray and CT. Um, so essentially, um, described in this diagram, uh, you've got atoms within your body. So the MRI can use protons, which are uh, hydrogen ions, um, and the magnetic field of the MRI causes all of these protons to line up in various directions. And then a radio frequency signal or pulse is emitted, 
um, this excites uh, the protons and um, causes them to spin around in different directions. Basically, once that radio frequency is stopped, uh, then the protons uh, realign or re relax back to their equilibrium. As they do that, they emit a signal, and that signal is what's picked up uh, by the MRI scan to produce the images that we see. So obviously, different uh, protons in different tissues will then re relax and uh, excite in various ways, and that's how we see different images being portrayed. Uh, the strength of the magnet is uh, measured in Tesla units. Um, at Western Health, our scanners are a 3 and a 1.5 Tesla magnet. Um, essentially, as you'd imagine, a higher magnet would produce a better quality. However, with the lower magnet machines, they do allow um, some metals to be used. So that's why at Western Health, we have the two different strengths. With the 1.5 Tesla magnet, there are some metalware, such as pacemakers, etc., that can go through that scanner. Whereas with the higher grade 3 uh, Tesla magnet, um, they're not permitted. Um, with MRI, we look at the two different sequences, so T1 and T2, and that's in relation to the basically the repetition time and echo time um, that's seen. So with the T1, uh, fat and bone marrow is bright, so that's the one on the left here, and with T2, um, the joint fluid and the blood vessels are bright, and so obviously depending on what we're looking for in the scan, um, we'll look at the, the varying sequences. The pros of MRI, um, it's the superior uh, modality for imaging of soft tissues, so ligaments, tendons, cartilage. Um, it detects changes in bone marrow intensity, so it's quite useful in osteomyelitis, malignancy and stress fractures. Um, the contrast which is used in MRI, which is gadolithium, is much safer than iodine contrast which is used in CT scanners, as a lot of people do have iodine um, allergies. And there's no radiation involved, which is the big one. Uh, the cons, um, there is more artifact with that. Uh, the patient has to sit very still and it's a long duration of about an hour. So um, for people that are claustrophobic or in young children, that can be an issue. Um, it's time consuming, it's expensive and it's less accessible. Um, and as I mentioned, there are issues with metal wear in body. So for a lot of people, uh, there's an absolute contraindication to having an MRI because of implants. Um, and it's less useful for bone viewing because there's uh, fewer hydrogen uh, within the bone. So as I mentioned, it's more relevant for soft tissue. The cost, again, the equipment's about $1.2 million, and for a scan, it's anywhere between $350 to $500, depending on the region of the body. Radioisotope scans, so bone scans. Um, this is uh, where an IV administered radioisotope tracer is uh, injected into the body. There are several different tracers that are used um, technetium, um, gallium, thallium, etc. The type of tracer used is dependent on a couple of factors the half life of it. Um, what uh, part of the body or tissue we're wanting to look for. Um, obviously, we want to trace it with a shorter half-life because there's less radiation exposure, but at the same time, we don't want one that has a too short a half-life because then uh, the scan's going to be over, basically, before um, uh, it traces all the way through the body. Um, it's a marker of biological activity within the body, um, and images are produced um, uh, by scintigraphy. Um, with radiation emissions from these isotopes which are picked up. There's three main phases um, with all brain scans. So the initial phase um, happens within the first few seconds where you're injecting the dye and they take um, images about five second intervals um, and that's the flow. Then within the next five to ten minutes you've got the blood pool, pool phase and this is where the trace is taken up throughout the vasculature within the body. Um, this is the important phase for looking at uh, well, essentially um, vasculature, so hyperemia, um, cellulitis, infection, um, and showing the, the blood flow to certain areas in the body. And then you've got the delayed phase, which occurs at about two to three hours um, into the scan. And this is where essentially uh, the blood uh, pool phase is over. Um, the trace is going through the vasculature and is now concentrated in the skeletal structures. So this is important for looking at the bony structures. Um, so technetium-99 is the most common tracer used um, in all bone scans, and particularly orthopedics. Um, that's because this is the best one for bone lesions. Um, it also has the, the shortest half-life with that of six hours, so it's safest in terms of radiation dose. And uh, it's deposited in areas of osteoblastic activity, so where you've got bone um, absorption and lay down. Uh, gallium um, is taken up by proteins found in healing bone many tumours. 
Um, it has less affinity for bone, but it's better for looking at infection in the bone. Um, so that's probably the more likely one used for certain infections in osteomyelitis. And indium uh, 111 is used for leukocyte labeling, so your, your white cell scan. So this is best used for soft tissue infections. Uh, the pros of bone scans, um, high sensitivity for bony pathologies such as benign, benign and malignant tumors, stress fractures and occult fractures. So when you've got a person that comes in and you're suspicious of a fracture, particularly a femoral neck, and it might not show up, um, you can do a bone scan. Um, infection or osteomyelitis, AVN, uh, prosthetic leucine and arthritis. However, we have to keep in mind that once somebody's had a joint replacement, their bone scan is going to be hot anyway for at least the first 12 months and then it will start to cool down. Um, so if they have uh, ongoing um, hot spots on bone scan following that period, then uh, in the clinical correlation might be suspicious of leucine or infection. Uh, the cons are the lack of the detail. Uh, there can be limited early sensitivity in patients that have a slow bone metabolism, so it's not going to pick it up. And it has a low specificity for bone pathology, but it has a high sensitivity. And the cost is anywhere between $480 and $600, depending on the, the type of scan and the trace used. PET scan, just briefly, um, we don't use it much here at Western, but I would imagine they use it a lot more at places like St. Vincent's, where they do a lot of the bone tumours. Um, it uses a metabolic tracer, SDG, um, and it reflects glucose utilisation. So uh, increased glycolytic rate in pathological tissues um, is going to have increased uptake. And as I said, it's widely used in oncology and tumour assessment, and it's quite an expensive test, up to about $1,000. Uh, this is just a slightly busy slide, sorry, just showing um, several of the uh, orthopedic conditions and different modalities that they use for and the sensitivity. Um, so brain scan uh, is um, relatively highly sensitive and sensitive. Um, and just briefly touching on radiation safety, uh, which is quite pertinent with orthopaedics because we spend our whole, whole life in theatre, particularly around IR machines. Um, so X-rays are a form of ionising radiation, um, and this causes damage to DNA. And obviously there can be uh, several consequences of X-ray, but the one we're most concerned about is the risk and potential for malignancy. Um, and that risk is approximately 4% per sievert that you're exposed to. Um, which is the measurement for um, x-ray. Um, and it mostly affects rapidly dividing tissues. They're the most susceptible. So bone marrow, breast, thyroid, gonads, and lymphatic tissue. Um, the average person, just generally in the community, is exposed to three millisieverts annually. And that's just from background radiation occurring in the environment, in the atmosphere. Um, the average orthopedic trainee is exposed to a further 1.6 millisieverts on top of this. I've just given a few um, rough estimates of, of what we're exposed to with certain scans. So a chest x-ray is about 20 microsieverts. Um, so it's relatively small exposure, but this can add up. Um, and that roughly equates to about four days of kind of background um, radiation that you're exposed to in the environment. A pelvic x-ray is 100 microsieverts, a wrist about four. A bone scan is uh, six, which equates to 600 chest x-rays or about 2.5 years of your background um, radiation exposure. And CT, which is the highest radiation dose, is anywhere between 5 to 15 millisieverts. Um, specifically, say, a pelvic uh, CT is 8 to 12, and that's about 400 chest x-rays, or about 5 years worth of background radiation. And this is just a small table down here, uh, which is just looking at risk of death from different causes. So, for example, natural causes, your chance of death is 1 in 800. Um, accidents at work, 1 in 43,000. But looking down here in terms of radiation exposure and the rate, if you're exposed to 5 millisieverts per year, you've got a risk of death of 1 in 16,000. And if that goes up to 20 millisieverts per year, it's 1 in 4,000. Um, in terms of the literature, and it's obviously it's hard to do studies um, into exposure and what's acceptable and what's safe. Um, so generally, uh, a lot of what's been recommended is looking at survivors from the atomic bombs um, that's happened in the past and their radiation exposure. Um, so there's not a real quantification as to what's safe and uh, what we should aim for, but obviously the, the least exposure, the better. Um, so in terms of radiation safety, so a surgeon um, is uh, typically exposed 
uh, from both primary radiation, from direct effects of the beam, and from scatter from the patient, from equipment, etc., within theatre. Um, and uh, so obviously it's quite important looking at radiation protection and safety, and there's lots of bodies, and particularly in Victoria, that set rules and guidelines. So we all need to adopt the ALR principle, which is as low as reasonably acceptable. Um, so limiting you know, as many beams as possible, how many IR shots you use in theatre. Um, and you can reduce your exposure by increasing the distance from the source. So the recommendation is at least two metres. Sometimes that's not practical, um, but that's using the inverse square law. So I think it's the, the further away you get, um, obviously the uh, I think it's a one to four uh, rule. Um, it reduces your risk by a factor of four. Um, increased shielding, so using our lead gowns, and that's covering everything, including the thyroid. Um, minimal screening times, and also increased contamination control and uh, looking at the upkeep of the machines that we use. So just briefly in the future, um, is obviously looking at computed assisted orthopedic surgery and we're starting to lose, use a lot more of that here at Western Health. So things such as your, your navigation um, tools, um, what we're using at the moment with the striker triathlon and also using uh, CT and MRI um, for preoperative planning for total hip and knees. Um, this is, covers a wide spectrum and kind of around the world. There's things such as a 3D guided image, navigation systems, interoperative uh, navigation, robotic assistive tools, um, and they're all things that are going to be coming out in the future. Um, however, it's important to remember these things are only assistant complement. They don't replace the surgeon, and it is kind of surgeon dependent. It depends on the experience of the, the surgeon and how comfortable they are using these things. The cons, the cost of the equipment, surgeon familiarity, and um, so far there's not a lot of evidence out there to show that uh, there's improved clinical outcomes with these navigation tools. Currently using about 5% of total hip and knee procedures worldwide. Okay.